So if you followed the channel for a while, you normally know that I do an actual intro, the little intro clip, the about six seconds long, and then I'll normally give you a little bit of a spiel and then we get into the video. That's usually how the structure goes. However, you've probably noticed even in this little bit uh, that my voice is quite different. And the easy explanation for that is, is that I've had a swollen throat for about the last week and a half and it has been a genuine pain. But I really want to get a video out. I'm really passionate about this video. I've been using some editing techniques that I hope you guys enjoy as well. And I'm really proud of this. So if the worst part of this video is that my voice sounds maybe 10% shitty, i got to live with that. And I hope you can too. So I appreciate you watching the video and hopefully you enjoy it. But I do enjoy the Rising Star. I think it is one of the better individual awards in footy. Yes, the Brownlow has a lot of controversy to it with the umpires now. And I do love the fact that we get to look at Generation Next. So I have a top 10 list of my best picks, if you will, to take out the award, my reasonings for them, and I hope you enjoy it. So for either the last or the second last time, we'll see how we go in 2023. Let's get into it. Number 10, Zane Dersma. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I can hear you say, Dazzling, we have watched all of your draft content where your man crush on ZD was close on restraining order worthy. What's going on? My easy answer to this is twofold. First, being his position on the ground. Half forwards, not really a love child for rising star winners. And considering the depth that North Melbourne have got in their side and especially in their midfield, is he going to get that time? Potentially not. Plus, there's another half forward at North that I like a little bit more in the Rising Star standing, so we'll get to him a little bit later. He's also not looking as AFL ready as potentially some other draftees on this list. On raw talent, he would be further up on this list, Zane, but I don't even think he's a lock for round one at this point. So we'll wait and see how he goes. But if everyone on this list played 22 games, it would be a different list. It just would. But a guy I love this much being at number 10, Probably should tell you how strong I see this list being. Number nine, Connor O'Sullivan. Now, Jared Rivers and Daniel Talia have won this award as key defenders, so it would not be altogether that strange for a key defender to win it. And again, a guy who I loved a lot coming into this draft, as you guys will have known, as you watched my draft content, which hopefully you didn't. Again, hopefully you enjoyed. But what COS has got in his favour is he's not the number one key defender at the Cats, which means he doesn't have to be prime Jacob Wiedering in order to win the Rising Star Award. If he can establish himself in the Cats 22 very, very quickly and play a very good second, if not third, tall role, he's going to be in good shape. If Tom Stewart at the Cats is going to play more midfield time, he is a guy who down there can play a role. But as we know, Sam DeConing is going to get the best defender. And then depending on matchups, you're looking at either Connor or you're even looking at a Jake Collajasny who can play the role beautifully as well. So get him in there, get him indoctrinated into the Geelong system, and I think he'll flourish really well. Yes, his position maybe knocks him down a spot or two. I still think there is a bias around guys who touch the footy more than others, and that's just not that's not a 2022 thing. That's not Harry Sheasel shade or anything like that at all, so that's not what I mean by that. But 22 games, pure talent, the fact that he's not going to be playing in a really bad team... I think all these things work for Connor really well, but I don't think he's got the best chance of all the cats. Now, Sean Manor should be on this list, but age-wise, he's ineligible. So, that sucks a little bit. I'll tell you who is eligible, though. Jai Clark, and he's number eight on this list. Uh, top draft pick, which we love, 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 which the Rising Star voters love, love, love as well. You think of Andy McGrath, Sam Walsh, these guys, Harry Sheasel, who won it last year, Nick Dacos, who won it, you know, all these guys are top picks. Jai was the same in the single digits. His ball-winning ability is very, very good. Now, this is dependent on whether the Cats are going to go young, young in their midfield. You think of a guy like Brandon Parfitt, who I don't think is 25 yet or wasn't throughout last season and still struggled to get game time. Now, was that youth policy? Was that Brandon? Hard to say, but considering Cam Guthrie's another year older, Patrick Dangerfield's on the other side of 30 now, they're going to need to roll guys through there. I love Max Holmes as a pure wingman, and now that Isaac Smith is retired... That should just be his spot for the next 12 years. There is a position there for Jai to take the absolute PI double five. And with the bigger bodies around him, I think it sets up a really good opportunity for him to establish himself as the best 22 player for the Cats, which will be reflected in his chances to win the Rising Star Award. Number seven, Daniel Curtin. Yes, I think he's got a better chance than Conor O'Sullivan at the end of December here. Whilst, yes, like the Cats, he won't be the number one defender at the Crows. He won't ask to be. 
or he won't be asked to be, I should say, the number one defender at the Crows. And the fact that he's been able to play a couple of other positions throughout his draft year means they might be able to show him off potentially more than Connor O'Sullivan. And whilst, yes, there are footy people that are voting on this, don't take away the ability that things like social media and highlights can bring. I still claim, and I do not throw any shade on Reese Palmer here, that if the 2008 Rising Star was around when Twitter was invented, if it was 2014 instead of 2008, Reese Palmer wouldn't have stood a chance. Because the social media whip around and the social media landscape that sport brings, Cyril would have blown him out of the water. Now, a lot of Hawthorne fans still think Cyril was robbed in that, and which there is a point maybe to be made there, but I don't think Reese Palmer's season should go under the radar either, and it's got nothing to do with finals. Reese Palmer's hair was outstanding, which I think could be a factor. But this isn't about Reese Palmer or Cyril. This is about the fact that we could see Daniel Curtin do some things at his height that not a lot of players can do, and I think that will stick in the mind of judges. This man is a freak talent, and Crows fans are going to want everything that they can do in order to keep this boy long-term, and being able to, to deploy him all over the ground very early in his season is going to be beneficial, not just for my list and my rankings, but for potentially Daniel himself, and more importantly, the Crows. To end the first half of this list, I'm putting Riley Sanders in this spot. Now, in my opinion, he should be top three. Hang on, Daz, this is your list, I can hear you say. You can put him in the top three. Yeah, but he's coached by Bevo. And we don't know what the hell goes on in Bevo's head. So, that's a problem. And yes, Bailey Smith did go down, but Jack McRae is going to not play on a half-forward flank anymore. Maybe. Still got Bont, Libba, Trelaw, these guys. You've even got, you know, just Riley West get a go in that midfield as well. Hard to say. But in terms of what this guy can do, he can win a best and fairest at the Dogs in the next three years. But whether his debut season is going to be him around the ball as much as maybe he would be in a different side... Hard for me to say, but his pure talent means he has to be on the list, and maybe his limitations in not only Bevo, but just how good the dogs are. Again, he won't be thrown into a permanent midfield role. Not that the last two rising stars were either, but we'll see how he goes. This feels right for me, even though it does feel a little bit icky. But in terms of talent, if someone told me five years from now, Riley Sanders is the best kid out of this draft, I would not be shocked at all. Number five, Colby McKercher, the second kangaroo to be mentioned on this list, and not the last, just quietly. But he's an elite kick. He might not need to be in a lot of contests. He won't need to be in a lot of set of bounces. But a guy on halfback is going to use the ball really well, get it a ton. He fits the bill there beautifully. He is incredibly smart. His footy IQ is fantastic. And, I, and contrary to the Riley Sanders thing here, not contradicting myself at all, but I did say when this uh, draft group do turn 22-23, he could definitely be the best of the lot and would probably be my pick. I still think that is the case. And of course, Clarko doesn't coach in a way that individual awards are all that important. So maybe a guy who gets it 22, 25 times a game might be a bit difficult to break through, especially considering the numbers that a Dacos and a Sheasel are having throughout their rising star years. But... I love this guy. And those that have been at North Melbourne training and speaking to a couple of people are super impressed with him as well. Number four, George Wardlaw. The second kangaroo in a row here, but considering that we like midfielders when it comes to this award, he's got AFL experience and applied himself beautifully. Give this guy 22 games. Yes, please. He is so exciting. Just an ultra consistent contested beast. And what he does more importantly is he makes the right decision offensively, defensively, with the ball, without the ball, his decision-making is exquisite. And I think that is going to hold him in ridiculously good shape throughout 2024. If there's a guy that I can think of that deserves a full run at it, he's probably number two on my list, and that's only because I'm a Hawthorne supporter and number one would be Mitch Lewis. I'm pumped to see what Georgie can do this year, and fingers crossed, it is everything that we hope for, and maybe even a little bit more if that's not too greedy of us. Number three, Harley Reid. How much is he going to have to do in order to win the Rising Star? Can we really see him being a permanent midfielder? Maybe, maybe not. Can we see him kicking 40 goals in year one and taking the Rising Star award out that way? Who knows? Now, everything that he does is going to be ultra scrutinized, which means that if you are a little bit sick of the Harley Reid treatment that the media has already given him, 
everything that he does this year is going to be put on social media. Now, I think that's for better in the way that his game deserves to be promoted. He's the best kid in the country at this point. Love that. The pressure that's being put on him is frankly ridiculous. And I don't think there is a way that he could possibly live up to the standard that is being expected of him in December, let alone what eight, nine months from now. And he could have an ultra consistent season. He could average 18 touches and a goal this year, which can you imagine how crazy that is? I think we only had three players last year average 20 and a goal. So 18 and a goal, extraordinarily good. And people would still see it as a failure. And I know not everyone watching this is going to be an NBA fan. And I don't care where you sit on your basketball opinion, but it's why we just have to marvel at someone like a LeBron James who came in straight out of high school. Everyone expected him to be one of the best of all time. He is, and he gets hated for it. It's not the only thing he gets hated for, but that's not the point. I just can't see how Harley is going to do what people think he can do in order to take out the award. And that's not even Harley's fault. One of the first videos ever made on this channel was our number one picks put under too much pressure. Now, that video objectively is terrible uh, because that's how I feel about most of my old videos, especially that first year. But I feel for him. <laughs> Unless he averages 25 and 2, which he's not going to, how are we going to be able to work past that? Did he, did he do what we are going to do? Bookmark it now. West Coast are not going to make finals. Early September, did Harley Reid live up to expectation and watch them dissect his season? Footy media, it can be ghastly sometimes. So on pure talent, absolutely. But he's number three on this list for me. Number two, Elijah Sardis. I, I, I love this guy. Love, 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 love this guy. Now, this is partly on Brad Scott here. The Scott brothers have got this in common a little bit, but maybe Bevo as well in a bigger way. Play guys in their position. Now, considering that you've got Merritt and Parrish, one, two, you've got to be like, okay, is it Sardis? Is it Hobbs? Is it Cordwell? Is it Shield? Is it Setterfield? You know, how many of these guys can you rotate through the midfield? That is a fair question. But he needs to be around the ball as often as he can. So he might not get the center bounce attendances, but, you know, have him come off a wing. You know, if Setterfield or Durham are a, a, on the bench or something, get this kid around the footy. He's silky. He's smooth. He's clean. The betting odds don't really have him as big a smoky as what I thought this would be when I put this list together just before I got crook. But I, I, I love what he does. And I think as a Hawthorne fan, I think people who are watching this who are also Hawthorne fans, maybe not enjoying how glowingly I've spoken of Essendon pretty much since the, uh, the grand final was played. I understand that, but I'm here to be as non-biased as I can. This kid is a star. And I hope Brad Scott can unleash him. Just maybe not for that round one game against the Hawks. Now, my number one. Currently on sports bet, gamble responsibly, and I'm not telling you to bet anything on it, but I just want to give you some context of when we say a smoky. But how does $67 sound in terms of a smoky? Massive smoky. My pick for the NAB Rising Star in 2024, Braden George. Now, you could sit there and go, can't you apply everything you said about Zane Dersma to Braden George? That's fair. My response to that would be, his body's a lot more advanced than Zane's is. His injuries aren't really footy related, and you've got to get some good luck in that. This guy was the steal of the draft last year. Well, two drafts ago, we'll say, instead of calendars getting all mixed up. I just, I, I love what he does. I think he's got the excitement factor. He's got the ability to get up the ground. People are noting that are going to North and reporting back to me that his aerobic work is going really well as well. He's put that muscle on. He looks ready to explode. He could be what I think people expect Cameron Zerhar to be on a consistent basis. Am I putting a lot of expectation on Braden? Probably. Do I think he's going to be ridiculously good to watch? Yes, I do. And considering guys like Luke Davies Jr. can't seem to get 22 games, what's Taron Thomas is going to be like for the majority of the season? Could he get thrown in there a little bit? Well, his body would suggest that he might, but they've still got Paul Lazaro and these guys that rotate through. But my God, forward of center. You know, can he do something like a Jake Stringer maybe? I'm not sure. But the untapped potential is there. So call it a feeling, call it a vibe. But his explosiveness, his accurate goal kicking, and I reckon his ability to wrestle back momentum on his shoulders 
are going to lead him in good stead. So it's not the pick you thought was coming, but I love this guy. And I love all of my lists. So what do you guys think? Comment below. Let me know. Who do you think is going to win the NAB Rising Star? Was there something wrong with my order? Do you think someone should have made the top 10 who didn't? I want to know it all. If this is the last video of 2023, I am working on another one, and hopefully I can across Christmas and Boxing Day. This is being recorded uh, on the 23rd of December. I just want to say a massive thank you for everything that you guys have done for me throughout 2023. Coming into this year, I had 702 subscribers. At the time of recording, I have 2,350. Well, I'm getting paid to talk about footy. This is nuts for those that have jumped on tiktok thank you for those that are watching the shorts thank you i look forward to doing most of those to those that have enjoyed the new sort of editing stuff graphics the upgraded thumbnails throughout the year thank you thank you thank you you enjoying my content helps me want to upgrade my content so without me going on too long a massive thank you i'm more grateful than you will ever know so I hope you had a fantastic holiday, whether you celebrate Christmas or you don't. Hope you enjoyed some time off, whether it's a couple of days or a couple of weeks. I can't wait to speak to you again. Get involved with the polls if you see them on the community page. Stay safe. Be well, you absolute legends. Goodbye.